Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. So I'm Rachel, and I'm sharing findings from a collaborative research study on AI and ethics that Anne Washington and I worked on together. And this study brought together her work on data governance and my work on race and digital activism. So to begin, I want to start with a short story around the unevenness of user experiences in online spaces, particularly around who is kept safe and who can freely express opinions and political dissent without intense harassment. So this story came out of an interview with a digital security trainer from Equality Labs, which is a Dalit-led South Asian community technology organization focused on ending caste and religious oppression. So for context, Dalit refers to the caste of people who experience the greatest disenfranchisement under a caste hierarchy that places Brahmins at the top. So in this interview, she reflected on this moment in 2018 when Twitter CEO and co-founder Jack Dorsey met with women in India, uh, met with women in India who represented religious and cultural minorities to discuss their safety as Twitter users. Participants shared experiences of trolling, harassment, and abuse on the platform that made it difficult to discuss systems of inequality around caste and gender. The goal of the meeting was for executives to better understand how the caste hierarchy undergirds experiences of online harassment and to discuss strategies for platform accountability. So at the end of the meeting, a Dalit technologist handed Dorsey a poster that read, Spash Brahminical Patriarchy. So Dorsey posted a photo holding this poster to his personal account, and in the aftermath, he was accused by some members of the Brahmin community as hate mongering. Twitter's legal head issued an apology stating that Twitter failed up to live up to its goal of being, quote, an impartial platform for all users. Yet, the statement of impartiality fails to consider clear differences in social and political power between castes that create differences in user experiences online. Dalit activists have suggested that in order for corporate platforms to act responsibly towards all users, they must actively pursue practices to protect historically marginalized users. The activist who shared the story says, quote, we've had these hierarchies and they're being digitized, end quote. In other words, pre-existing biases in the surrounding social world can be replicated in technological practice. This example in similar cases brings forth questions around whose values and interests, sorry, this example in similar cases brings forth questions around whose interests are represented and whose lives are valued and by corollary possibly devalued. Further, this case helps us understand that data-driven technologies aren't just tools, but also spaces of encounter for different relations of power. To address the spectrum of experiences with technologies based on pre-existing marginalization, we introduced the term digital differential vulnerability to explain disproportionate exposures to harm experienced through data-driven technologies. We came to this turn by juxtaposing interviews with community organizers alongside a qualitative and quantitative analysis of 20 different ethics codes focused on data science, machine learning, and AI. Recent concerns about the power and responsibility of data technologies have spurred the publication of multiple ethics codes in the tech industry, often articulating technology's potential benefit to society or the social good. Yet defining what is good for society and what justifies harm for the wider public can create new vulnerabilities and perpetuate old ones. Seeing ethics codes as an important symbolic commitment to society, we framed our investigation through sociologist Howard Becker's provocation on social positioning. Whose side are the ethics codes on? We also rooted our study in Sylvia Winter's discussion of how within society's hierarchical orders, categories of protected life imply a category of unprotected life. Winter helps us consider who benefits from social good and who bears the risks of harm. So today I'll be focusing on our findings from the interviews, but very briefly from the ethics codes. Just wanted to share the three findings. One, that there's a two-tiered system of social value. Two, a lack of clarity in the language. And three, often an apolitical framing of social good. So for the interviews, as part of my own research on the relationship between digital technologies and leftist social movements, I conducted hour-long interviews with 30 activists and organizers representing various communities of color with expertise in technology development, network coordination, and digital media strategy. Throughout these interviews, one of the main topics of discussion was organizers' perceptions of values promoted by corporate-owned platforms. By bringing these interviews alongside our analyses of the ethics codes, our results challenged the assumption around what is publicly good and concerns of society at large. So three key points emerged from these conversations. First, platforms' claims towards technological neutrality or impartiality fail to, often fail to address disparities in costs and benefits across users. One person shared a story about how the lack of specific accountability measures on social networking platforms creates unsafe online spaces that translate into other forms of harm. She shared her experience in participating in a 2016 Twitter town hall hosted by 18 Million Rising, which is a pan-Asian American political advocacy group. 
The town hall focuses on addressing sexism within Asian American communities, and she observed how women and femmes participating in this conversation quickly became targets of harassment and abusive language. After the forum, her personal information, her telephone number, email, workplace, had been posted and circulated online. She said, quote, it's scary because anyone can walk in and find me. Online toxicity doesn't just exist online, it seeps into physical spaces where you work and live, end quote. So her experience here offers an example of differential vulnerability given the digitization of social hierarchies, such as the replication of longstanding systems of gender bias in online spaces. Second, a concern raised that was that potential profit overrides other, overrides other principles and values. Aware of their positions as consumer users on these platforms, organizers felt both wary and frustrated that they needed to rely on corporate tools in their pursuits of social change. They expressed concern that ethical principles become undermined by a corporate bottom line. For example, one organizer shared their concern over public and private partnerships, such as the use of Amazon's cloud services that has enabled data sharing between law enforcement and social media platforms, which creates potential vulnerabilities for people who may be undocumented and also potential bias in the criminalization of people of color. This demonstrates both differential experiences and definitions of what may be considered good for a public. Finally, organizers share that technological solutions are really sufficient to create social change. Several organizers felt that technological solutions would continue to perpetuate social stratifications, asking questions such as, quote, why is it that people who haven't had access still don't, end quote. And they were like, referencing issues such as housing access or also the freedom of migration and mobility. As one organizer suggests, rather than imagining social good as, quote, a, creative, a cool creative problem to solve, end quote, designing for more just societies requires incorporating directly impacted communities in the process of tech development. Part of platforms' lack of accountability to vulnerable user groups may stem from a lack of deeper relationship building to may stem from a lack of deeper relationship building within these communities. So examples such as Twitter's responses to community safety, organizers' critiques of corporate value systems, and their observations on the limits of innovation def demonstrate differential experiences of both good and harm. I'm sorry, this is the quote from the designer and community organizers. These struggles are not just an issue or intellectual problem, but you see how people are impacted by those struggles on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so to end, I want to offer up one recommendation. In speaking with organizers, they suggest that technologists building solutions to societal problems can develop more accountable relationships with directly impacted communities, rather than approach challenges to society as something to be solved through technological empowerment. Um, and so such relationships will better also inform the multiple contexts, including geopolitical, racial, and gendered factors within and across communities that data-driven technologies should consider in their ethical determinations of social harm and good. So I'll end there. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to further discussions with everyone.